My guest on this edition of In the Credits is, in fact, name guest. He is motion picture actor, writer, composer, producer, director, Val Guest. His autobiography is called, So You Want to Be in Pictures. The subtitle is From Will Hay to the Hammer Horror to James Bond. We're going to talk to Val about all of those things and much more. Hi, Val. Glad Hello. you're with me today. Hello. Hi. I know you always loved the theater as a youngster, and I have a feeling that that's probably what led you into all other areas of show business. What was there about the theater in London that was particularly appealing to you? Well, to start with, my mother was an actress. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, she had retired, of course, and everything. So I knew vaguely that side of it, although I didn't know my mother that well at that time. But uh, I was working, and I hated it. Uh, I was on the, in the accounts department of the Asiatic Petroleum Company. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one day, they, somebody said to me, I understand your mother was in the, uh, the, I think they saw a copy of the stage newspaper yes. on my desk. And I said, yes, and they said, well, we're going to give a charity uh, show next month, and uh, we'd like you to get it together. I said, what? And so I started to round up people with the help of my mother uh, to do a, a charity show at the uh, uh, Alhambra Theatre in London, the old famous old Alhambra. And I got absolutely involved in getting all these famous names. Ivan Novello, who was a well-known film star and composer and yes. author in those days, and, uh, onto the stage. And I got absolutely fascinated by the stage. Yes. And so from then on, I, I, I went, uh, I, I thought, oh, this is, this is the life. <laughs> and I uh, helped with a couple more of those sort of charity shows and everything, and gradually tried to edge myself into it. It gave you the bug, didn't it? Yes. But how did you get involved with The Hollywood Reporter? Because The Hollywood Reporter in London also led you into the business, the film business. Yes. Thing. Well, with, with The uh, Hollywood Reporter, I originally, uh, when Alexander Corder was making The Private Lives of Henry VIII, mm -hmm. He brought over a, a very well-known uh, American makeup man uh, to make up all these lovely ladies and Charles Lawton and everything called Jimmy Barker. And uh, I ended up sharing a flat with Jimmy Barker. And Jimmy said to me, why don't you uh, write all the bits and pieces around the studio? I'll tell you all that in London and everything. And I was then writing various articles for various film papers and this, that, and other. He said, do a column for uh, Zitz, New York Review, it was in those times. And that was the second biggest show business paper to uh, Variety. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I sent a, a column over to Zittel, who was the owner of Zitz, and said, you know, can you use this? And so I got into Zitz and, and wrote their uh, reporter, their column once a week, their gossip column from London. But Billy Wilkinson had read my column. He was the owner and publisher of The Hollywood mm -hmm. Reporter. And when he came to London, asked to see me and offered me the job of being London editor. And he said he'd publish every two weeks, he'd publish The British Hollywood Reporter. Wonderful. And you made a wonderful mistake, as far as your career was concerned, by panning a film. <laughs> yes. Tell yes. That, that's a great story because this well, is how some people get into show business. You, you came in by the most unusual route. <laughs> this is the great well, story. Uh, I, I, when I was doing the British Hollywood Reporter, which was published inside the Hollywood Reporter mm -hmm. every two weeks, uh, in the brashness of youth, I reviewed one film, uh, a picture with Edmund Lowe called Chandu the Magician. And it was directed by uh, a French director called Marcel Varnell. 
And I reviewed this film, as I say, brash as I was, saying if I couldn't, I gave it a terrible review and said if I couldn't write a better film than this with one hand tied behind my back, I'd give up the game. And uh, Billy Wilkerson called me one day in London and said, I've just had a call from Marcel Varnell, the director of that film that you panned, uh, saying if your reporter is so goddamn clever, let him write my next. Uh, so he said, go and see him. And I said, oh, Billy, listen, I couldn't, couldn't write a film. I don't know how to do it. And, and he said, well, he said, you can't make the paper look goddamn stupid. Go see him. And I said, I can't. I'm in London. He said, so is he. And he happened to be in London at Elstree Studios. So I, I went and interviewed him. And, and uh, he said to me, I said, I can't. I'm sorry. I was being very stupid. Uh, and he said, no, he said, I've read your column, and he said, I think you might help on our scripts. And so he signed me to work with a very good screenwriter called Roger Burford, who was one of the top mm. ones in England at that time. And that's how I got into writing screenplays. <laughs> and that's probably the most unusual entrance. One of your greatest collaborations was with Will Hay, a name not known to American audiences, unless they go to retrospectives of yeah. his films. But tell us about Will Hay, because he, he was well, Will legendary. Hay, in, yes, in he England. was a legendary comedian. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, we sort of, when I say we, I mean my writing partner then was a fellow called Mary Edgar, uh, and we were under contract to Gainsborough Films hmm. through Marcel Varnell, who finally put me under contract and when Gainsborough signed him. Right. He said, I'm like bringing Val in too. So, uh, and uh, they had just signed Will Hay. They made a big scoop and got him into films mm. uh, because he was one of the leading music halls, or vaudeville, as it's called here, uh, comedians. Uh, and he always played the sort of bumbling schoolmaster who had uh, excess dignity and not much uh, to back it up with his unruly bunch of schoolboys. It was a terribly funny sketch on stage. And we sort of brought this to the screen. So I did, I don't know, I did about eight, eight or nine films of Will Hay. For several years you worked with Oh him, yes, you know. I did, yes. It was almost a um, symbiotic relationship. You, you knew each other so well. Yes. You could tell what would work and, and what wouldn't Ab work. Absolutely, yes. After a while you got to know this. While you were at Gainsborough, one of your office mates or someone down the hall from you was someone named Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, him. Oh, him, <laughs> yes. Somewhat yes. Of, a, of a legend also. Oh, yes. But uh, I've, I've learned from you and from your book both that uh, Hitchcock had a rather nasty sense of humor, a practical joker which wasn't always that much yes, fun to be on the cruel receiving sense end. Of humor. Cruel sense. A cruel sense. Yes, he was a practical joker. What did he do to you, well, which you luckily were able to get revenge on? You stopped him from doing this. He was able to do it with other people on a regular basis, but he did something to you. Tell that story. Yes, he did. Uh, his secretary came in to see me one day, knocked on my little office door next door, and it was near the weekend, and he said, look, she said, Hitch has run out of money. Can you lend him 10 pounds until Monday? And well, 10 pounds was half my salary, it was my rent, my everything, you know. And I said, well, yes, lo well, I said, yeah, all right, as long as I get it back on, on Monday, said, you'll get it back. So I doled out 10 pounds for him. And uh, it left me very broke for the weekend and everything. <laughs> and Monday came and no money, and Tuesday came, no money. <laughs> Wednesday, no money, and finally I saw her at lunch because Hitch was on location at that time, I didn't see Hitch. And I said, look, please, I've got to have this money. She said, don't worry, it's afternoon. And that afternoon, there was a tap on my office door, and the, the Gainsborough page boy lugged in three sacks and said, Mr. Hitchcock said, thank you very much. And I'll tell you what the sacks contained. Ten pounds worth of farthings. Now, uh, uh, there were 240 pennies in a pound. There were um, four farthings in every penny. 
So you could imagine what ten pounds was. They were these sack full of farthings. Well, I mean, getting them to bank was bad enough, but uh, it was really terrible. So I thought, oh my God. And I suddenly had an idea, and I went round to everybody in the studio, all the props and our fellow writers and friends, and I said, look, you know we all have old keys in drawers and everything. Give me all your old keys. And I, all these keys that were lying around that nobody was ever using anymore, I had an enormous amount of these keys. And I spent the whole week, instead of writing the scripts I should have been writing, <laughs> writing little name tags, which George, my partner, and myself tied on these keys, saying, uh, Hitchcock, 117 Brompton Road, finder will be rewarded. And the whole of the studio went and dropped these keys all around London for me, on the buses, in the undergrounds, at, at Greyhound tracks, Hyde Park, everywhere we dropped these keys and waited. And there must have been about uh, at least 200 of them anyway, these keys. And we waited and waited, and nothing from the door, office next door and everything. And uh, one morning, my door opened and this moon face of hitches came around and looked at me and said, how many bloody keys did you drop? And <laughs> he never played a trick on me because he was having to pay people. That's right. To, to bring these, who brought them all back. And his doorbell never stopped, I was told. <laughs> and I remember too, once in, when he got to Hollywood, he'd made a picture called Strangers on a Train. Right. Strangers on a Train. That's right. And everybody thought he was going to get the uh, Academy Oscar. Award for yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, I wrote him an Academy Award acceptance speech, which I sent him in Hollywood, uh, just as a gag. In fact, I sent it Western Union at that time. But he didn't get the award that year, which no. is sad. And, and I had, uh, the, the speech I gave him was uh, that he said, uh, I want to thank everybody for this award. Uh, all the pic people of the motion picture industry. And, uh, of course, uh, I mustn't forget my accountant, my manager, my agent, and all my family, without whose help I'd have won this years ago. <laughs> and, and Hitch called me from Hollywood and said, I'm going to use it, I'm going to use it. So it's great, but he didn't win it that no. year. By the time he got psycho, he'd lost it, which is probably just as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was soon after your practical joke that he left London, so it was probably because of you that he left, <laughs> do you suppose? It? <laughs> but it wasn't long after that that the, the war broke out in London, in, yes. in England. Yes. And uh, you became a member of a fire brigade. You were still working at the studio at Gainsborough. I was still at the studio. But you, you did something for the effort. And, uh, well, it was, it was a fellow called Stuart Granger that made me do Stuart that. Stuart Granger, the actor. Who yes, was, yes, yeah. who was then under contract to, to Gainsborough as well. And uh, everybody was being called up and sent overseas to the trenches in France and everything. And uh, uh, Jimmy Granger, we call him Jimmy, Jimmy Granger came into my office one day and said, listen, be smart, sign up in the Home Guard or the Fire Brigade. And then if you're doing this, you can still keep your job here mm -hmm. because you're in this business. And uh, so I signed up in the fire brigade. I thought that was easy enough. There were times during the London Blitz where we were all with the bombs coming down and we were out with these hoses and things. Mm -hmm. And I thought, God, wait till I find Jimmy Granger again. <laughs> I would rather be in the <laughs> trenches. <than be> over <laughs> there. No, but that, yes, I did. I was in the London Fire Brigade during the Blitz. It was during the war when you were finally given an opportunity to do your first film as a director. But it wasn't, <laughs> yes. it wasn't a feature film. No, it was it something wasn't. for the Office of War Information. Is that Yes, correct? it's yeah. the Ministry of Information. The Ministry of Information. Because right. what happened was eventually uh, I was taken off out of the Fire Brigade to work in Gainsborough, where I was still under contract. Um, because we were in a, what they called a reserve profession, because the Ministry of Information, and they wanted us to keep on making propaganda films, and, and mm -hmm. so uh, as writers, as a writer, I was only a writer, uh, we were in a reserve profession, so-called. And one day, the studio brought to me, the, our executive producer, Morris After, brought a, a, um, 
a request from the Ministry of Information for me to write a picture, uh, a film, a little documentary short, uh, which would tell people if you have colds and things, stay at home because you're going to give it to the munition workers who are not going to be able to make. And so uh, uh, it was the idea being that coughs and sneezes spread diseases was the whole thing. And I heard that they had asked several other writers before this to do it, and then they had turned down what they had written. And I put on an Academy Award performance and said, how dare you come to me? I said, so you expect me to work now? And I finally said, look, I'll do this on one condition, and that is that if you accept what I write, that I direct it. And that's how I got my first <laughs> directing film. And as luck would have it, there was a picture on at the Odeon in Leicester Square in London, uh, which was called My Gal Sal, with Rita Hayworth mm -hmm. and Victor Mature. An American so, film. Yes, a yeah. Hollywood film. Hollywood film. With yeah. Rita Hayworth. Yeah. And one of the top London critics gave it a bad review and said, the best thing on the program was the Ministry of Information short. <laughs> <laughs> so I got this wonderful room. I took it to my executive producer, Gensman, and said, look, 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 can I, can I, can I, will you let me direct? <laughs> and from then on, you were from able then to... then I was able to write and direct my own, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. And that's a most unconventional way of getting into the directing chair. <laughs> yes. My goodness. Oh, speaking of directing chairs, I didn't ask you this when we were talking about Will Hay, but... There's a wonderful story about a chair that you maintained throughout your career that um, Will Hay gave you. Oh, yes. Let's well, go back on, a few on years. The, the picture which has gone into the museums and everything now, in fact, they showed it, the Hollywood Egyptian showed it a few weeks ago. That's right. They had this. Oh, Mr. Porter. Oh, Mr. Film. Porter, yes. yes. Well, on Oh, Mr. Porter, Marcel Varnell, who directed all those things, uh, you know, took me on the floor. I was a sort of the odd gag man, and, this, and if anything had to be changed, I was there as the writer. And I didn't have a chair or anything to sit on. I used to sit in everybody else's chair until they booted me out of them. And I used to sit on fuse boxes and <laughs> wardrobe hampers and things. And uh, that was that. At the end of the production, uh, when we'd finished, about a couple of weeks later, there was a tap on my door, and the old page boy came in with a big brown paper wrapped thing saying this is from Mr. Hay and it was he it was a, a little note on it which said uh, this is yours you've earned it and inside was a studio canvas chair with my name all on the back of it and everything and Bill Hay had given it to me and I mean, and this chair went all through my career all over the world with me and uh, I never did a picture without it. Wonderful. And uh, I have 70 stills of famous bottoms sitting in this chair. <laughs> and finally, I gave, somebody said to me, Sotheby's would like it. Put it up for auction. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you're joking. They said, no. So I, right, I put it up for auction. And, and I, the, one of my favorite things I still have is Sotheby's catalog with my chair in it. <laughs> And I didn't have the heart to go through with it. And I redrew it. And I said, no, 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 take it, take it back. And I gave it to the British Film Museum, you know, the National That's Film great. Museum at the, uh, on the left bank. In fact, the cover of So You Want to Be in Pictures is me sitting in that chair. Looking very dapper. Oh, I don't know about that. I do. But I, I tell you the interesting thing about that story is I get, uh, that still is on the front. It's First time I've had top billing, because the rest of that still is me directing Doug Fairbanks Jr. and Yolanda Donlan, yes. my wife, yes. <laughs> and they've cut those out and put the chair there. <laughs> Funny. And 1947 Funny. was a great year for you personally, because that's when you first met the woman who would eventually become your wife, Yolanda Yolan yes. Donlan, yes. an actress, an American-born actress. Absolutely. But you met her primarily because of a play she was in. Yes. Born Yesterday was That's right. an Love. American play. Yes, but by Garson she was Kanan, in a, yeah. Who was her co-star in that? Well, uh, not exactly her co-star, but a co-starring name, co -starring Laurence name. Olivier. Laurence Olivier. Well, Laurence Olivier yeah. brought her to London yes. 
from New York at the same time that Judy Holiday was playing it on Broadway. Right. Yolan was playing it in London mm -hmm. in Laurence Olivier's first stage production of his own. He directed it and produced it with his own company. Ah, yes. He didn't do it, he wasn't in the show with her, but it was his first his first first thing. Yeah. So uh, and th there was a, a small part actor in her show who was doing a film with me. He was playing a small part in the film I was doing. And where we were sitting, which you usually do in England on location, in the rain, in our cars, waiting for the rain to stop, uh, he kept saying to me, you've got to come and see our show, you've got to come and see it. And I said, yes, I've read about it. Uh, um, uh, yes, I will. As soon as I finish the picture, I'll, I'll buy a couple of seats. And he said, you won't be able to buy a couple of seats. He said, look, I'll get you one seat on Saturday and come and see the show and I'll try and get Yolan to let you take her and me out to dinner afterwards. And now that's how I met Yolan. And I, it was a terrifying meeting because I went round the stage door and Michael took me down to her, <laughs> Michael Balfour was his name, took me down to her dressing room, banged on the door and said, here's Val. And she said, oh, bring him in. He opened the door and there was Lance Olivier, in her little tiny dressing room, there was Lawrence Olivier, Vivian Lee, Noel Coward, uh, Beatrice Lilly, another famous comedian, Legendary, yeah. and uh, the Duke of Woburn. And I looked at this and said, oh my God, I'm out of my depth here, I must run, you know. And that was my first movie, <laughs> we call her Yo or Yo Yo. Yeah. When you first met her, wasn't that around the same time that you met Peter Sellers? It, he, he wasn't yet well known, of course. No, Peter had a, a very funny uh, 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 TV, he was in a sort of a TV review with other comedians, yeah. with Harry Seacombs and right. people. And uh, we thought he was terribly funny on, on uh, a screen on on the TV and and on, and on the radio you had a radio, radio program, program yes. too, yeah. and uh, Yo said he, we should do a picture for him, yeah. and, and uh, eventually you did. So I wrote a film for him called Up the Creek, right. and we couldn't get anybody to touch him. They all said, "Oh, Christ, you can't put Peter Sellers' name up on the thing. What's he going to bring in? Who's he going to bring in?" So I mean, these are the English people, not the American ones. And uh, so finally, it was for Hammer Films, was this comedy. And uh, uh, James Carreras, who is the, the boss of Hammer, said, well, look, if you want to do this, get me an English name, something we can sell, you can see. And I got the very top com light comedian then called David Tomlinson. Mm -hmm. And they accepted him. He wouldn't be known over here, but he was there. Uh, to launch Peter, right, and, and we launched him. And, and David eventually became well known to us because of Mary Poppins. He was the father. Of course, of yes, of course you would. But know. he was yes, well. Yes. He was far better known than uh, Peter Sellers. It's hard to imagine. Oh yes, because he, no. he yes yeah. he was because over there he was also uh, um, a sophisticated like comedian, mm -hmm. and he'd done an awful lot of pictures in that role, that sort of role. So they accepted him to get Peter in. You know. Mm. And uh, so he did, and Peter never thought he was going to make it anywhere. Well, he obviously did, didn't he? Yes, he sort of did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than marry you, however, uh, Yolande agreed to be a star in some of the films that you wrote and directed. So that was, that was a gentle way of keeping her in touch with you. I was it? keeping her in London, Keeping too. her in London? Yes, sure. Rather than having her come back to the States. Yes, stage, although right? born yesterday, ran a long, long time. But I finally talked her into it, and I wrote a film for her in the Douglas Fairbanks studio called Mr. Drake's Duck. Doug agreed to do it and come on over. It's very funny. It tells you what billing does. When I wrote it, it was called Mrs. Drake's Duck. Oh, Mrs. Drake's Duck. Yes. Yeah. And Doug agreed to come and do it on condition which made it Mr. Drake's Duck. <laughs> you think, my goodness, the things people ask for. Actors. Yeah, you wonder whether Warren Beatty ever thought anybody would ever ask him if it could be Clyde and Bonnie instead of <laughs> Bonnie and Clyde, or Hardy and Laurel. Hardy, so, yes. doesn't, doesn't scan. Yeah. Doesn't. <laughs> now, in the early 50s, you had an interesting experience with Betty Davis. But she was very demanding. And at one point, I remember you 
in your book, and you've told me this when we've talked, that uh, she was particularly concerned about her cinematographer. Oh, yes. That, Robert Krasker, yes. whom she didn't know. But he was, well, he was an Academy Award winner yes, in England. Yes, well, I tell you, yeah. well, two of her stipulations of signing the contract was that she had Irving Rapper to direct it, because she she'd done now Voyager with him. And mm -hmm. she Irving trusted. Rapper, who was known around as the Iron Butterfly. Anyway, she liked, wanted Irving Rapper and, and an Academy Award cameraman. So uh, we managed to get Robert Krasko, who got his Academy Award for the third man for shooting all those crumbling, crumbling yeah. uh, buildings and yes, war-torn Vienna. And uh, so uh, those were her two signed rapper and the, the cameraman, and that was that. And uh, uh, you want me to tell her about the, about the test? Oh, uh, yes. Well, the first makeup test, I think, it was the night, it was the day after that she and uh, Gary Merrill, who she was married to then, who was coming over to do the film with her, because I'd written the other part for him and everything. Uh, they'd had a sort of carousing night, and uh, Bobby Prasco did his best, and got all the things out, and they did a, a very good, actually, uh, makeup test of her. And we were all in the theater the following day in the projection room to watch the test, the makeup test, and Betty was sitting in the front row. And the uh, lights went down, the thing came on the screen, and uh, I thought well, Betty looked reasonably good for what it was and everything. And suddenly Betty's voice came in the darkness saying, and for what did this man get his Academy Award? And there was a moment silent, and a voice in the darkness at the back said, from shooting ruins. Well, Betty got up, walked straight out. Well, that was the thing <laughs> that almost started a revolution, but somehow we glossed it all over. over. And no one knows who that voice was. Yes. And it wasn't Krasker. It was no, it wasn't Bobby Krasker. Krasker. No, I know who it was, but this is Deep Throat. Yes, we the, the we know it as Deep Throat. Yes, now, the, yes. the Watergate. Uh, Deep that's Throat right, that's yes. right. <laughs> But she must have been fun to be around after she got past her uh, Yes, oh, she was. Yeah. She was great. She yeah. had an enormous sense of humor about everything except herself. Really? Yeah. Uh, you couldn't kid with her about herself, but everything else, she had a raucous sense of humor. And I remember at that time, uh, Yolan was starring with Richard Attenborough uh, in a, th a play in London that had run for everything. It was one of the top comedies in London right. at that time. And Betty, that time, wanted to see it. And I said, well, we've got to sneak you into the theater because we can't see you. And she, went, she came with a scarf and almost like a yashmak. And it was the Garrick Theater in London. And uh, Yo, Yoran hates to know anybody's in front when she's on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing she doesn't want to know is who's in the audience. Mm -hmm. So uh, I explained this to Betty, who understood. And she came, you know, as a nobody. And we sat in the stalls. And this raucous laugh of of Betty's was starting the whole audience going into paroxysms. And uh, it, just before uh, the first act curtain came down, the, uh, Dickie Attenborough and you were sitting on a couch on the front looking at the audience, towards the audience. And Dickie suddenly said, as the curtain was coming down, he said, I just seen Betty Davis in front. Well, of course, it's finished you almost. You know. <laughs> So anyway, that was the opening night of that, and, and uh, so we Betty we slunk her in, and then afterwards we couldn't slink her out at all. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, she she had a great evening. No, she was great fun. Had as I say, a raucous sense of humor. Yeah, Shortly after that, you wrote another film for for Yo. Her play with Attenborough had finished. Though. Yes. You worked on something called The Penny Princess. Oh yes. And I understand that Frank Sinatra was hopefully going to be the co-star. Well, I, t I tell you what happened on that. Uh, one day, um, one of Yo's old friends from when she was at MGM as a dancer and everything, one, a writer friend, we met in the polo lounge. And uh, uh, he said, look, Frank Sinatra, by the way, was having a very tough time. He'd had trouble with his throat. 
uh, his recording contract had been discarded, right. and he was on the down. And this writer friend of yours uh, uh, said to him, look, Frank's opening got a, a date at the Coconut Grove, and he needs friendly faces around the thing. Will you come? Yes, great, we did it. So we went there on his opening night. And Frank was very good. And, uh, but he was at that time on the downs. And uh, Yo's writer friend, who had written his act for him, not this thing, said, look, you're, you're here looking for someone to go to London and, and, and do this with Yo. And I said, yes. So he said, well, what about Frank? He said, he'd love to go because it would give him a lift at mm -hmm. this time. He said, well, yeah, that, uh, yeah. So anyway, after the show, he said, Frank loves the idea. And he said, call him when you get back from London. And he said, he'll, he'll even pay the reverse charge of the call. You know, so It was one of those things. So we go back to London, and uh, we talked to the head of the studio, Pinewood Studios, and said, look, we can possibly get Frank Sinatra. And Frank Sinatra, he said, oh, who wants to know about Frank Sinatra or something, you know. And so they turned him down absolutely flat. And it was only a few months at the most after that that he got... Uh, from here to eternity. Yes, from which, here to which eternity, so, which got him up out of the thing. But that's how nearly that's we helped France and Archer. And people say, you did what? <laughs> well, that's a long story. <laughs> In Penny Princess, there is a, a funny scene involving some smuggling that you shot at night oh, with yes. Dirk Bogard. Well, Tell that, that very story. quickly, the story of Penny Presents was, a, was a, a girl who worked in the basement, bargain basement of Macy's, mm. and suddenly found that she was the only surviving relative of a very rich, a very rich old man who owned the principal, principality of Andorra, <laughs> which was in Spain. And he'd left this to her. So she had become the princess of Andorra, of all things. And the Andorran uh, economy was based on that they smuggled a thing called schnapps into France, Italy, and Germany. And this is how they kept their economy going. And schnapps was a mixture of uh, uh, cheese and uh, liquor. Schnapps, schnapps. So they called it schnapps. And this uh, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, cheese was sent all over the place that you could get as high as a kite on. And she came there and found that this was what they were, how they, she was princess of this little town, this little principality. Uh, it was modeled on Andorra, which is in the Spanish it's a place of its own. Oh, yeah. But they didn't want us to shoot it there. They did, was, obvious reasons because that's how they live on the smuggling and uh, so uh, we called it Lampidora and we shot it in Spain so. but anyway the whole thing of the big night scenes of the smuggling this over the mountains and uh, it, it took a lot of organizing the smuggling with all the torches and lamps done at night over the mountains and all these big packets of sneeze going over <laughs> to Switzerland Germany and uh, on the night we organized the second night of shooting, uh, I had about 200 extras and everything, you know, we had the whole union dark, and suddenly police cars screamed into our little mountain town there. Uh, they had everything. They had Guardia Seville, they had soldiers, they had the lot. And we found that real smugglers were using our crowd scenes to get their stuff across the mountains. So we were not only helping the smuggling, but lighting the mountains for them so they could get over. And so they, they rounded up the whole lot. So we had a terrible time doing all that. We had to, had to do it another night once they'd arrested all the smugglers. <laughs> the smugglers must have enjoyed working with you. Ah, I don't know. Never oh my goodness, they, they almost ruined our film because. Now, in the early fit in '53, you worked with, I believe, for the first time with Hammer Films. Yes. On something called Life with the Lions. That's right. Hammer Films has become legendary in this country. Yes. 
primarily as the producers of, of horror films, horror films yes. or science fiction films. But yes. in the early days of Hammer, yes. which was a very small studio, barely yes. enough room to shoot a scene. Uh, to get a long shot, you put your bottom in the fireplace, you know. <laughs> Back up that far. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, and, uh, no, they, they, had, they didn't have a studio then at all. But it that was, was Hammer. It was called Bray, was it Bray Studios? Bray Studios, yes. But they had not yet made their reputation as no. a producer of horror films before no. when you were there. However, shortly after that, 1955, I believe, you were approached by, was it Michael Carreras? Michael Carreras, yes. And you were on your way to vacation, and he wanted you to, to consider doing a film version of something very popular in London. Most Americans, unless they're real fans of, of the BBC, would not know about the Quatermass series. Oh, yes. No, that wasn't Michael Carreras. Was that it Michael? Was, uh, no, Anthony Hines. Anthony Hines, who was Tony Hines, likely yes. to be the producer for that. Was the producer of Hammer, yes. There was a very famous television series, uh, uh, this uh, science fiction television series right. that was on for weeks and weeks. And uh, people used to be riveted. They all stayed at home on the Thursday nights when it went out. Yeah. Nobody went anywhere. And I was the only person who I'm sure in Britain that who never even looked at it. And they asked me if I'd like to do it. In fact, Tony Hines met Yoland and I. We were on our way to Tangier for a holiday, a break in between her plays and my films. And uh, Tony Hines arrived at the airport with this enormous thing of television scripts. Yo said to me one day, aren't you going to read those? And I said, well, it's science fiction, you know, I'm not really into that. And Yo said to me, since when have you been ethereal? And I thought, oh God, I better read it. And I took it down to the beach to read and was riveted. And that's what convinced you. And that's convinced me and uh, I, uh, I, I said, yes, if you still want me, yes. Well, it's really interesting because the first of the films, you, you made two Quatermass movies, yes. but the first of the films, which was released in the States under a different title, transformed you from a director of comedies or yes. light yes. romance yes. Yes. into an acknowledged director, writer-director of science fiction, yes. quite by accident, and uh, probably helped Hammer immensely because up to that time, very yeah. few of Hammer's films yeah. were getting wide release in this country. Yeah. But it was released over here yes. and got great attention yes. and is now one of the, the cult movies it's of that era. It's cult. quite interesting. It's very yeah. funny because uh, in the book I say, had I known that several of my films were going to become cult movies, <laughs> I'd have asked for more money. That's and right. I got a letter from Tony Hines, producer of Kratom, saying you wouldn't have got it. <laughs> <laughs> he was funny. a great character too. That's funny. But your your take on science fiction is different from others during that era. Your your interest was well, what? I I always thought that the more believable that science fiction is, the less it mm -hmm. becomes science fact right. almost, even though it's science fiction. And I decided to do Quatermass experiment. Uh, uh, I said to Tony Hines, yes, I'd love to do it, but I would like to do it as though the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, had said, go and cover this for the panorama thing, right. uh, for one of the documentary programs, to cover it almost as a documentary and to use almost newsreel technique now and then. And I did that on all my so-called science yes. fiction ones. All of your sci-fi movies were black and white, and they had a documentary yes. feeling to them. You worked on three different films with Hammer, which have become legendary in the science fiction films. We've already mentioned Quatermass One. In England, it was called that. Yes. <clears throat> and then you did a second Quatermass film based on the BBC series, yes. which was equally successful in this country, again, under a different title. And then you did a, a, a wonderful little film, which was very topical for Hammer, called The Abominable Snowman. Yes. It's called something slightly different in this country, but not really much change. I think they added yes. in the Himalayas over here. That's so right. It wouldn't be the same as Bombable Snow one of Laguna. Laguna. No. Or something. No. So we had to clarify <laughs> where it was. Yes. It was in the Himalayas. Yeah. But on that film, you had a, an actor, a, a British actor, who has become legendary in this country, thanks to not only Hammer movies, but yes. to Star Wars, and that yes. was Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing was not only a wonderful actor, but he used to enjoy bringing in 
little pieces of business and surprised oh, you. Oh, yes. So he, he was called... He was, uh, we used to call him Props Cushion. Props Cushion. Cushion, yeah. yeah. Because uh, he would uh, work on his part so much and get his character organized without telling anybody and would always have come up with some little prop in, in a scene and everything. And, and they were always absolutely right. But you could tell he'd put a lot of work in. Mm -hmm. And on at Bob Nobster, one time when the, uh, the, uh, the Dalai Lama in it almost had uh, given him the, the Yeti tooth, they were looking for the abominable snowman, the Yeti, and uh, the, 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 it, out in the <coughs> Himalayas, and the, they had this tooth, this almost historical tooth of the Yeti, and Peter picked it up during the scene, not during rehearsal, yes, he picked it up in rehearsals, and looked at it and everything, and when I said, all right, let's do a shot, took a shot, and in the first shot of that, he picked up this thing and he took his magnifying glass and he looked at it, which he'd done all the time. And then suddenly he put his magnifying glass down and he took a nail file out of his pocket and started to scratch the thing like this. Well, I mean, everybody collapsed. They didn't on screen, but they tried awfully hard not to. And, and for some reason or other, they were able to not do it. In fact, it was Forrest Tucker, I think. Yeah? Yes. Yes, an old tuck, as he used to call him. He was trying desperately not to crease up. Out of the unit were all... <laughs> this is the sort of prop he would come up with. And it would be 100% right. In fact, it made it look wonderful. It's still in the film because I've said, yeah. right, print, that's, that's it. Right. That's the first that's take. Right. And everybody just collapsed after that because you never knew what prop Peter was going to come up with. He must have just been a natural actor. He was. He, he just in, brilliant. almost instinctively knew yeah. what to do. I tell you what is interesting about him is that uh, he started his life as a barrow boy in Petticoat Lane Market. And his wife got him to learn English language because he was Cockney, he mm. was everything. And uh, he became this Shakespearean actor. He is wonderful. Yes. And he has become as popular over here. Yes. in his films that he made in England, yes. as he was in England. He was yeah. a wonderful character on set, because you always got to laugh somehow or other. Uh, he would do a very dramatic scene, this, that, and the other. And then suddenly when I'd say, cut, okay, he'd go on to knees up Mother Brown and start... Do a dance. <laughs> dancing with the Cockney songs Going and Going back to his yes. youth. That's wonderful. Great character. About four years later, you did a, another science fiction film, which we'll get into in a moment, but in between that last Hammer film and the, uh, the film which eventually led to you getting a British Academy Award, you did something called Espresso Bongo. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about what was there about Espresso Bongo, which had been a play, wasn't it, on, on It was on the a stage? musical in London, <coughs> and uh, Yo came back, had been to see it with a girlfriend, right. and came back and told me about it and said, there's a hell of a movie in this, let's go see it. And she took me to see it, and I really wasn't all that taken with it. I thought, yes, it's a good movie, but you know. So, I mean, do they want to know about launching a pop singer? I mean, uh, and uh, anyway, she was the one who organized me to do it, because the, the author of the play was a very well-known writer called Wolf Mankiewicz, mm -hmm. who written novels and books and things. She got a friend of ours to organize a party to which she invited Wolf, and without telling me, just to get me to meet Wolf Mankiewicz at the party. And this is how she got me into doing Expressive Bongo, which I, we, I, we got an awful lot of awards all over the world with this thing. I would never have done it if she hadn't organized my meeting. Good for her. And, and uh, I, I used to, I signed Wolf, and Wolf did several films on me because uh, I loved working with him. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, we did this, and uh, with Lawrence Harvey and Yo, and Cliff Richard, who and is Richard. again not well known in America, no. sadly, but he is now Sir Cliff, which means Sir Cliff, Sir Richard. Cliff Richard, yes, which means Sir. he must mean something to somebody in London. Yes, well, but he, he was the equivalent of Elvis Presley. To absolutely, us. he uh, was uh, <coughs> that popular. This yeah. part of the, our part of the world, Elvis Presley. Right, he was terribly popular. Cliff Richard, yeah. recordings, everything. And uh, this, he was unknown when we launched him in that guy. Mm -hmm. looked at all the pop singers then, 
the people like Billy Fury and the various yeah. people around in Europe. Who, and uh, I got a call from one day from uh, somebody who read it in the paper, and a fellow said, "Look, uh, I have a, a I have a two uh, called the Two Eyes Bar in Soho." He said, I, "I I own the bar," and he said, "We have a kid singing in the basement. You might like to have a look mm -hmm. at him because he read about me looking for the bongo." Uh, and uh, we went and saw Cliff and uh, his. Uh, little four-piece band that he worked with, who at that time uh, called themselves... Uh, the ooh, Drifters, I believe. The Drifters. Yeah. And uh, I finally signed Cliff, and he was underage, so his mother had to come and sign the yeah. contract, and I thought he could do it, I thought he was wonderful. Yeah. And he said, can my mates be in it too? And we said, yes, but you can't call yourself The Drifters. So we launched them as the Shadows. There was an American group and, and uh, called uh, the Drifters at oh that yes, time, very, very popular, famous. Yeah. Yeah. And <coughs> with the Shadows, they've made all made yeah. their mark on their own even now and everything. Right. And yes, as you say, he's now Sir Cliff. So, so Cliff. you got him started. Now, in 1961, you had a, a film, you finally got around to getting permission to do a film which had been a dream project of yours for a number of years, the day the earth caught fire. <laughs> Surprise. It's, it's certainly one of my favorite films of yours, and it's one of my favorite films of all. Oh, that's nice. And not to only hear. because it's so excellent, but it looks better now. It looks more interesting now than it did mm. 20 or 40 years ago, because yeah. what you were talking about in that film yeah. is what we're talking about now yeah. on the news yes. global warming. Yes. We didn't call it that 40 years ago. No. But tell us a little bit about the origin of that and, and why you had so much trouble getting it done. Well, we had terrible trouble getting it done because the, the, my story was about uh, uh, the uh, Russians and the... Uh, United States. Yeah. And the Americans, yeah. yes, letting <coughs> off a test atom bomb at either ends of the Earth at the same time by sheer coincidence and the resulting jolt of this uh, if shifted the Earth's axis by a billionth of a point mm. so that the Earth was now drifting slowly towards the sun. So that the climates changed, the North and South Pole melted, there were floods throughout the world, uh, everything became so hot, water became a, a currency. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, at first, it was really global warming. And having written this thing, I sent it to the science editor of the Daily Express, when I'd written my story, not, not the script. And I sent it to him and I said, you know, what do you think about this as a story? And he sent it back with a note saying, yes, a hell of a good story, but a lot of nonsense. <laughs> this was the science correspondent. Yeah, I'm afraid he's not with us anymore, so I can't say, what? <laughs> But no, anyway, and no, everybody said, who wants to know about you know, atom bombs exploding? Mm -hmm. You know, I had a terrible time putting it together. I mean, getting someone to let me make it. Yeah. And finally, I had to put up Expresso Bongo and another film we made that was making yeah. money as collateral. Yeah. And they let me make it. Well, it's a wonderful film. And it's on DVD, so people watching this yes. can go out to their local... Yes, it's on video, it's on DVD, it. yes, it's all and, uh, right. it's, yes, just, it's wonderful. It's, it's and we were lucky well. enough to get the British, British Academy, Academy Award, Award yeah. for the script. It's like your other science fiction films, it, it has a documentary feel to it. Yes. And as you've said on previous occasions, you like to have your actors speak on top of one another very rapidly because that's more natural. That's what happens in real life. In real yeah, life. Yeah. And this film is perfect for that type yeah. of uh, performance because it just seems like we're catching people in a conversation. So I, I hope people watching this will get enticed yeah, enough to great. purchase it that's or rent great. it at least yeah. because it's a wonderful experience. And now a few years later you had a very enjoyable time with Charles Feldman uh, on, ah. uh, on Casino Royale. But you found out that working with Charles Feldman was not going well, to be a lot of fun. Uh, well, Charlie Feldman, you, you, you loved him one day and wanted to throttle him the next. Okay? <laughs> he was a very likable character. He's a producer. But, yeah. yes, the producer. And, I mean, he I mean, had done, you know, these famous films like 
street car, like, you know, he was seven year producing he seven was very year well respected, yes, yeah. all of them, yes. He was yeah. a top, top guy. But he could never make his mind up, really. He'd make his mind up, and then at four o'clock in the morning, he'd wake you up on the <laughs> phone and change his mind. <laughs> and so you went through the film, and the thing started with uh, my, my agent calling me up one day and said, Charles Feldman is in town and wants to know, would you like to do a picture back to back with John Houston? I said, well, that's the strangest question I've ever been asked. What does that mean? And he'd signed John already to do, and then they wanted me to do another sequence. And uh, they were supposed to be episodic segments, he called them, mm -hmm. Charlie Film. And there were going to be five different segments sending up James Bond, all the James Bond films. And he was going to uh, get three more directors besides John and myself. And I thought, well, yes, sounds an experience, and it certainly was. <laughs> and there's a film to be made about the film you're making. <laughs> that film it was, it was chaos. It was just one day after another of uh, indecisions Absolute, and confusion. Absolutely, and, and also one day and another, people getting fired. And I mean, the directors got fired, and, the, and, and Charlie Feldman would say, well, look, take this over, finish this <coughs> over. And then John Houston, one day, coming out of the dailies, one day said to me, uh, it's going to be a load of crap, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, well, no, John, they've engaged people like you to make sure it isn't. He said, don't you put it all on me. <laughs> and then he left you with yes, two he more said, scenes. He said he uh, uh, that he was going to Ireland to play poker. He finished his thing, and he wasn't going to extend it. And he said, uh, you'll love working with Deborah. So I said, who? He said, Deborah Carr. He said, you know, he said, hasn't Charlie Feldman told you? So I said, tell me what? He said, that you're going to take over all my sections I haven't finished, which included Deborah Carr. <laughs> so that's, that's the sort of chaos we got in on that. And part. you work with Woody Allen. Woody Allen was on your segment. This is the second movie he was in. He had yes. not yet begun no. directing. No. But he had written What's New Pussycat That's right. for Feldman. That's right. And I guess he had a terrible time with Feldman on that, yes, cutting his yes, lines yes. and everything. But on this film, he did the same thing. He wrote yeah. a script, and Feldman kept coming in and cutting the punch lines. Is that That's correct? right. Yeah. Yes. He, or he would, uh, uh, Woody came to our house, uh, uh, and Woody and I sat up all night, you know, trying to write his segments and things. And then that would go to Charlie Feldman, who would uh, send it back, having cut out the punch lines, uh, and saying it's too long. And he cut all, and uh, Woody Allen said, he's a murderer, he's a murderer. Uh, so I said, well, look, don't worry, because when we shoot it, we'll put them back on the set, which we did. Nobody knew anything. That's but at the end, Charlie Feldman, because he said, uh, we've got a whole hodgepodge of stuff here, it needs a storyline going through it. I said, yes, it does. <laughs> So he said, well, write one. And uh, so I, I said, I'll do that if I can have my two favorite people who keep my sanity, David Nevin and Ursula Andres. I'll yeah. write them all through as a link. He said, oh, you do it. All right, we'll do it. And at the <coughs> end, he invited me with William Holden, who was one of our guest stars and everything, to dinner. And he said, I've got a surprise for you. He said, I'm going to give you an extra credit. So I said, oh, so he said, yes, he said, I'm going to give you, as well as your own credits, supervising director. And I said, Charlie, thank you, but if you do that, I'll sue you. So he said, why? Sue me? Why? I said, people are going to look at this and say, this was coordinated? <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to get a terrible name. So <laughs> but that's the sort of chaos we But your name with. is on the credits twice, yeah. as director yes, yes, and as coordinating director. It's an odd credit. But it's probably one of the very few times that a director has appeared twice in the same film. Yes. Very unusual. Well, <laughs> it was a very unusual but film. <laughs> it's, a, it's a strange little movie. It has some yeah. wonderful music, but it's a strange little movie. Yes, I know. What it's become again. Became it's a cult movie. Things. It's one of your cult yeah. movies. And I, ironically enough, David Niven, who is in the movie, yes. was Ian Fleming's Absolutely. First choice to play James Ian Bond in the film. He'd it's written this whole thing with that yeah, sort of a David Niven, he said. Isn't that marvelous? And David, he said the first book to David, too. 
Right. Which was this one? Wasn't it Casino Real? Wasn't the first Casino, one? Yes, went to David, and yeah. David read it and said, "Yes, this is this is rather fun," and he sent it to his partner, Dick Powell. You know the um, actor from the television. Dick Powell. Yeah. They had a thing in America called Four Star Theater that they produced together, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, David sent it to him saying, "How about doing this for Four Star Theater?" And uh, Dick Powell <laughs> sent him a cable back saying, "Are you out of your mind?" So that's how they, he yeah. never did it until his last thing. That's funny. That's funny. But at least he got to play, Ian Fleming was still alive when the film was made, so yeah. at least Ian Fleming had a chance yeah. to say, well, yeah. there, you see. That's but you see, the strange thing about Casino Royal is having got to Casino Royal, having bought the script, the book of it, is Charlie Feldman found that the other Bond pictures had taken everything mm -hmm. out of that book with the exception of the casino. Right. So everything had to be written brand yes. new. I want to close our wonderful conversation with a quote from Woody. And Woody said, I think it was probably at the time you were doing this film. It may have been different. I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah. This would have been the middle 60s. I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it by not dying. I think that's, that's a great attitude to have. Absolutely. That's what's Let's kept not me at, die. That and your land is what's kept me alive. Well, <laughs> I don't want Woody outliving me. No. No. Well, well, he right, shouldn't. So, I don't no, think he both, has any reason to. But we're both... We'll both be remembered, maybe, because we're still around. <laughs> Absolutely, and not only that, but you've done some extraordinary work, as anybody watching this can tell. And I, I cherish will. our friendship, and I'm glad you were here well, with me thank you very today. Much. Great. And ladies and gentlemen, join us again next time for In the Credits. Thank you very much. Not worried.